We're here today with Mr. Hubert Francis Leach. He, Hubert was born on December 29th, 1926. Today is January 29th, 2014. We're at the Warren Historical Gallery in Warren, Michigan at the Warren Community Center. Hubert was a veteran of the U.S. Coast Guard Reserve in active service from November of 1944 through May of 1946. Served in World War II. I'm Brian Lowers with the Warren Weekly Newspaper. We're here also with Marcel Gooden and Louis Kerman of TV Warren. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. Mr. Leach, thank you for your service. You're welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Okay. If you could tell me a little bit about your early life and uh, where, <coughs> where you lived uh, with, your, with your family when you were born. I was born in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, actually, Washington Park, Illinois. Uh, suburb. I uh, lived there about a year. My dad worked as a conductor on a streetcar there, and uh, he uh, got an opportunity to transfer to Detroit to a railroad job with his brother. So the family moved there about after a year after I was born. Uh, I was at Highland Park, Michigan. And uh, through the years following, uh, I attended school at Atkinson, Edmund Atkinson grade school, uh, John J. Pershing High School. My dad worked as a dairy worker uh, doing uh, primary work, stacking cases and loading milk trucks and stuff like that for a number of years. And he moved in as a cashier and uh, worked as a cashier in the creamery offices. How old were you when you started working? Uh, when I started working, uh, I, was, I started when I was 17. I worked, did some, worked with a bricklayer, uh, doing a little labor. I worked two summers for Detroit Creamery. Uh, had a, a terrible job, but I took care of 42 horse-drawn milk routes. I had 42 horse stables to clear out. <laughs> uh, after that, I, because of uh, home life being upset and a little school problem, it's a problem that I wanted out, so I enlisted. I served in the Coast Guard. What year did you enlist? In 1944. Okay. And the war had been going a couple yeah, it started a couple years before that, four years, I think it was before, 41. Did you have brothers or sisters? I had two sisters, yeah. One older and one younger. Do you recall where you were when the war broke out? Well, 1941, yeah, I was, uh, when I first heard about it, I was in a uh, uh, schoolroom at, at Pershing High School, I, my first year at Pershing. How did you find out about it? Uh, somebody came in the room and mentioned it to the war had started. Or, uh, the president had declared war in mm -hmm. Pearl at, Harbor. At that point, did you know older older boys that were older men that were being called to serve? Yes, yeah. I had had an uncle, two uncles that were already in the service. When the war started? Yes, they were drafted. What branch did they serve? Uh, one was in the Army Air Force as a uh, Armorer, and one was a foot soldier in the Army. So you enlisted in November 1944? November 1944, Thanksgiving Day. Tell me a little bit about your enlistment. Did you just go to the office to do that, or how did that work? Well, I started out trying to get in the Navy or the Marines or the Army, but they were taking no, no enlistments. It was only drafted men. and. Uh, the last resort I had at that point was to check out the Coast Guard, and they took the uh, interest and, and got me signed up. And they had a Coast Guard uh, enlistment office enlistment in Detroit? Enlistment office in Detroit, down in McDougal and Jefferson. So you walked in and said, I want to join the Coast Guard, yep. and they, they signed you up yep, right then right, on the spot? Right on the spot, yeah. Okay, then how old were you at that point? Seventeen. Had you discussed that with your family leading up to that, that you wanted to serve? <clears throat> no, I hadn't. Well, I, I hadn't really, no. I uh, was in school and not really getting along well, and uh, 
my family was breaking up, parental breakup, and uh, there wasn't a lot of communications in, in the family at that time. So once you enlisted, what, what happened then? Did they ship you out right away? Or? Uh, my parents signed a paper, both of them, and uh, I was gone. I signed up on the 17th, and on the 24th I went in. November, Thanksgiving Day. What was that like? So you took a train somewhere, I imagine? Yeah, I had a Union Station. Dad drove me down to Union Station, the family did, and uh, I got on a train with other recruits from the area. We went to um, Manhattan Island Training Station in New Manhattan Island, New York, for boot camp. Is that where all the Coast Guard training was yep. done? Yep. Part of our training was next door at the Merchant Marine Training Base, where they had uh, swimming, indoor swimming, and we trained with. Uh, Johnny Weidmuller was our instructor, or a group instructor, you know. Tell us a little bit about what Coast Guard training was like in those days. What, what did they have you guys doing? Well, mostly it was uh, ships, uh, structure, uh, you know, the mass, the, the siding, the different sail structures. Identification? Uh, identification type thing. Uh, the merchant the vessels and military vessel uh, identification, plus airplanes. Uh, by this time, you were studying uh, shadow, plane shadows, uh, what they call them, uh, silhouettes for identification. Was there any sort of specialized training that you were getting at that time for your ultimate job? Uh, no, I was taking boot camp. I was in boot camp about four weeks. And, I, and during that period of time, I took some tests, and they were I was identified as having a mechanical aptitude. So they sent me to basic naval engineering school in Baltimore, Maryland, Curtis Bay, Maryland, actually. And before I forget to ask, which what rank did you achieve when you were in the Coast Guard? Fireman first class. That was your final rank. Yep. Yep. Okay. So how long did your training take? Uh, the engineering training took uh, uh, five weeks. And it was basic training was how long at that point? Basic training was well, it was longer. It was three weeks. It was supposed to be longer, six weeks, but they pulled me out and some other guys in uh, three weeks. So I never went through things like uh, a lot of the rifle training and the camping and bivouacking and all the other stuff they would put guys through. Did you have a pretty good idea at that point what you were going to be doing once you were in the Coast Guard, what your job responsibilities would be and what the Coast Guard was doing as it pertained to the war effort at that time? Yeah, they uh, explained it at uh, boot camp when we were first there that uh, we were going to serve as troop carriers uh, supporting military action from a distance, more or less, uh, carry troops to combat zones and troops from combat zones wounded, rehabilitating groups. What about submarine warfare? Were you guys in any anti-submarine warfare or anything like well, that? Well, we, we took evasive action uh, in submarine times, but the ship we were on was powered enough that our speed was pretty, pretty good. We could stay away from the heavy submarine routes, and we tried to outrun them when we could. And, uh, we were on a zigzag course all the time, and uh, we had what they call uh, veins for mine sweeping that ran out from the ship that would, when we were in, in island area, we'd do mine sweeping for the uh, Navy. Uh, we hauled equipment, trucks, tanks, jeeps. Uh, besides the personnel that demand them. So your training wrapped up, do you recall when your training wrapped up in the East Coast? Uh, let's see. Yeah, it would be the end of March in 45. 
And from that point, did they ship you out somewhere else? We went by train to Los Angeles, no, to San Leandro, California, and into Frisco. So it's March 1945. It's pretty, you know, getting close to when Germany surrendered. The war's yep. kind of winding down, yep. although there was a lot of fighting left in the Pacific, certainly. Yep. What was the mood in the country like at that point, if you recall? Do you remember what it was like to be traveling with other well, I know the, uh, it seemed to me that the bulk of the, bulk of the people that we encountered were uh, respected the military uniform and, the, and what the guys were doing was giving them credit for it. Uh, we, we had a lot of opportunities to, you know, share ourselves with the, uh, the local civilians. They seemed to be interested in winning the war, so to speak, you know. Uh, there was a lot of support there. What were you guys doing for pastimes at that point when you were, I guess, before you shipped out when you were, you know, kind of well, when in I, training? And when I was in training, I was home from the service at Christmas for 1944 Christmas. I was also home for the 1945 Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, it was uh, weekend passes when you were in in port. You get pass and uh, just run around, see the area, get familiar with the community. So you left training. You were on a on a train. Uh, and you shipped to where again? To uh, well, actually, we ended up at Alameda Training Station in in uh, Alameda. California. So at that point, you'd come from Chicago, we, where, you were, yeah. where you were born, you moved to Michigan, you shipped out for training on the East Coast, yep. and then you're taking a train to the West Coast. Yeah. You're seeing a lot of the world <laughs> yeah. already yeah. at right. that point, yep. you're 17. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's, it was a massive experience for a young man to try to absorb all of that, you know, and still learn the, what they were trying to teach you for military purposes. So what was it like when you finally got to Alameda? It was, we were assigned a, what they called a P-9 crew, which was a uh, Admiral class uh, troop ship, which was called the Admiral Mail. It was never commissioned. It, the, war, the war was so near an end that they figured they didn't need it. So they switched me to the Hodges assignment. Not just me, but the troops, the whole crew. We had a P-9 crew was assigned to General Hodges. Tell us a little bit about the, the General Hodges. Well, let's see. It was 26 feet loaded, 26 feet underwater, and uh, seven stories above water, seven decks above water. And what was its classification? It was an AP-144, attack, um, armed personnel, 144, a troop carrier. Was it a was common it, troop carrier of uh, that? The there was several of them. There were other, other ships in the same style, the same uh, model. Uh, we sailed more or less, we followed a, a, a route so to speak, around the world. Uh, the Admiral, uh, the General Green was ahead of us, as, as an example. Mm -hmm. And there was other ships of, of the general class that came behind us at different points. We would see them in different ports as we were, where we were docked, different times. So you guys followed the circuit then, basically, from one port to the yeah, next? Yeah. And yeah, picked up troops, dropped off troops, carried supplies in and out. So you were assigned to the Hodges when? Yep. Uh, let's see, in March, probably, I think the assignment was right at, when we first got to uh, Alameda, would have been in April uh, that year, 45. 45. And when did you guys take to sea? May. What's the crew on the, on the Hodges? What, how many, what's its complement? Uh, we started with 317 men, and I think there were about 18, 20 officers. 
the crew drew the crew size brew to 700 men by the time they assigned the Army Corps representatives. We had Marine Corps uh, conti guard contingent, and we had Navy uh, manpower for we operate under naval orders. So you guys had a, had a variety of services represented on, yes, on yep, the ship? Yes, yeah. Yeah, we transported, uh, besides soldiers, uh, we transported army nurses and uh, wax and uh, so many other female service branches. What's what's the what's the fireman uh, classification? Your job? What, what, what were you taking tasked with doing? Engineering, on the ship? Uh, in, anything engineering on the ship. You were manning boilers. Uh, in my case, I was making fresh water out of salt water, and what they call the evaporator room. And how many hours a day did you do that? Uh, a good twelve hours, mm -hmm. sometimes sixteen. I, I, my, that was my living quarters, was right in that room. So I lived right where you worked? Yeah. On the ship? Yep. And how many other guys were with you doing that job? Four, there was four of us all told, three other men and myself. What were the conditions like? Well, it was a, uh, the fan tail at the very back end of the ship, and every time the water, screw came out of the water, you could feel it, and you could feel it when it went back in, the vibration would tell you where where you were up and you were down. Plus you had levels on the, on the tanks to sure you the water flow so that you wouldn't. But it was, would affect the maneuverability of the ship by the amount of water you carried, the weight of the water. We had four huge tanks in the back. Um, we had water boilers that we operated that would boil salt water and the salt would cling to the pipes in, in the evaporator, and you'd end up with filtering out cold water. And periodically, you set the boiler down, flush the salt back into the ocean, and started fresh water again. The most pure water went to the boilers for the ship's engines. Second rate of water was potable, potable water was for eating, drinking, cooking. You said the best water, the ship got the best water yep, that you yep, made. Yep. The, third, the third rate of water was used for you know, shower, scrubbing, cleaning the ship. It was wash water, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it was maybe cramped and hot in the room you were in. It wasn't cramped. We had a lot of room, uh, but it was narrow spaces in between the tanks mm -hmm. where you were walking back and forth and checking water levels. and water temperatures and salt levels and different things. And uh, we had one little one corner of the room was where our boiler controls were. And that's where we were basically most of the time. But we had our bunks, hammocks, swung back among the tanks where we could, that's where we went and took our night's rest, you know, our rest periods. Loud? Not really. It was the loudest part was when the screws would go back down into the water and you boom, boom, boom. The vibration would could wake you up if you were not a good sleeper. What about the, the heat? Sounds like you had some boiling going on. Was it that make it we hot? Had, well, there? except that we had uh, four good fans, good out, outdoor air fans that brought air in and out. You know, so it's a good ventilation. Yep. And even in the Pacific, where it was still with hot weather, it wasn't that hot in the engineering. In that in that area, compared to the engine room itself. So, so you're working 12 to 16 hour days. When you're not working, what are you doing on the ship? Sleeping. Sleeping, writing letters. Um, I took some schooling, some. I took some classes uh, in uh, geology and uh, to finish my high school education. They call GEO, GED. Mm -hmm. So you guys head out to sea. Where's the first place the the 
ship goes we, before you headed? When we, we left uh, San Francisco. Do you recall when that was again? Uh, I think again that was late April, uh, or early May maybe, first of May. And uh, our first tour was down through the Panama Canal around to the New York docks where we picked up troops. How long did that take? Uh, 13 days. So again, you're, you're seeing the world probably different. Yeah, things from different. Uh, yeah, Panama Canal, I, I had studied in school, but had no idea what it was until we traveled it. Uh, from New York, we went to, uh, we were, took troops to Naples, Italy, past the Azores Islands, past the Rock of Gibraltar, which was all new sights to me. Uh, it, we, in the Mediterranean, we saw the north shores of Tunisia and, and uh, Libya and some of the other nations, countries. Uh, we ended up in Egypt. Docked in Egypt? We docked at Port Said, Egypt. Said is S I A D, like I said. And that was the mouth to the Panama, to the uh, Suez Canal. So you've been through the Panama Canal, and now you're going through the Suez yep, Canal? Went, yep. You are through the Mediterranean Sea. Truly seas, traveling the world at this yep, point. Yep. Went down through the Panama, through the Suez Canal, down to the Indian Ocean, uh, where we went to the nation of India itself, into the Hooghly River. Don't ask me to spell it. But what was the name of the river? Hooghly. Mm -hmm. I think it's H double O something uh, G H L I or something. Hooghly River. Uh, we went to uh, Karachi, India. And there we picked up, we dropped off troops and nurses, and we picked up the wounded and the returning uh, soldiers of Merrill's Marauders. They were the Burma China Theater soldiers. So you have a chance to talk to any of these guys you're transporting, and where? Well, they were time? they were kind of uh, they were we were told they were pretty wild. Stay away from them, mm -hmm. and uh, you could watch and see that there weren't many orders obeyed. They they did what they wanted to do, but before you take them on, uh, no matter where we picked up troops, if they had been there very long, they had to go through a decontamination tent where they they'd go in and their clothes take their clothes off be decontaminated come out the other end get clean clothes and that was to debug them so to speak and that we had that set up on the ship everywhere we went we had set that up on the dock were you hearing you're traveling through much of the war zone at that point you're going through yep. ports in europe north africa down to down to india yep. you're in the far east now at this point you've got to be hearing some some pretty incredible uh, Yeah, tales. we, we, we uh, picked up, like I say, we picked up different troops, and some of them would, you had, always had storytellers in the group, you know, and uh, clowns and, and uh, characters wanted to let you know what's going on in the world, you know. And uh, we heard a lot about the, the, the way of life for the natives in the different lands, uh, up in, say, in, uh, in northern Burma and northern China there, with the Japanese soldiers were so brutal with them that they hardly trusted any, that anybody came in there. It took them a long time to get the Chinese on their side, uh, like for combat trustees, you know. Uh, their way of living was different, their clothing was different. Their attitudes were different, the voices were, uh, you know, their language is different. And all this to a new soldier was 
difficult to absorb. So where did you guys go after, after Burma? Uh, we left India. We sailed to Sydney, Australia, where we didn't. We picked up some more supplies, and from there we went back to San Francisco. So at that point, you'd circumnavigated the globe. First time, yeah. Well, our ship traveled ninety thousand miles in. Uh, O a little over 90,000 miles in uh, 15 months. And that's equivalent to three and a half times around the world. You writing home at, at this point? Did what? Are you writing home at this point? Oh, yeah. yeah. I tried to maintain a stream of mail, and so did my family, but uh, delivery was difficult. Rarely. <laughs> Yeah, rarely they'd catch you. Uh, every once in a while, you get maybe three or four months of mail in one shot. You know, I was gonna say how how the how did you ever get any mail, and how did your well, your, we how like long did it take your family to get letters from you. They experienced the same difficulty. We had uh, uh, sensors on the ship, and uh, every letter we wrote was reviewed. So there was only certain things that you could say. You know, you couldn't tell them exactly where you were. You might say South Pacific, and that's that's the best you can do. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, otherwise it was scribbled out. Um, I still have copies of letters that I sent home that had been censored. And my family saved them for uh, example, and you can see where they the, the censor had crossed items out. But uh, many times you would have. Uh, Somebody would ship you some cookies. By the time you got them, they were almost dust. They beat up so bad. Hubert, can you tell us a little bit about some of the different rituals that would take place on the ship when you cross certain waypoints that were of note at the time? Yeah, we went, uh, oh, we, our second trip out, we headed west from San Francisco. We crossed the international date line and the equator at the same time. At that point, there's a naval tradition that uh, recognizes sailors who cross that point. Up to that point, you're, until you get there, you're a polywog. After initiation, which can take two or three or four days, uh, haircuts, uh, soap in the mouth, uh, everything they think of, beat you with a straw club. Until you got the pirate flag down, we flew the pirate flag, but until we could get that fire, pirate flag down, the initiation service went on. The initiation was performed by men who had gone through the ritual before on other ships and other assignments. Enlisted guys or the en Enlisted and officers, yeah, both. The officers shared it. We had an officer that served as Neptune. He came over the side of the ship with his courtyard contingent, uh, uh, and the, they carried the, the Neptunus Rex, carried the spear, you know, the tripod or whatever. Uh, it was, it didn't matter who you were, crew members or soldiers uh, or nurses or wax. You went through that initiation, and you got the recognition. You got a uh, certificate, and it was added as part of your life record on your, supposedly on the military. It's coded, so I never saw it. But so, if you were, I guess, being transported, you went through the same procedure. You, it, it if, if you were on the ship, yeah. Yep. If you were on the ship, yeah. Okay. You could. You were expected to participate. So, although some, some of the women nurses didn't participate. They, Stayed out of it. Did you know anything about that before you got in the no. Did you know anything about it before you crossed the equator in the international date line? Uh, about two or three days before, we knew it was coming because uh, we could see costumes being made, and you know, uh, they set up a big pool, swimming pool, kind of a swimming pool on the deck, and part of the initiation was you got dunked in that pool. They cover you with shaving cream and put your head underwater. <laughs> Now, 
did they do that on the way to San Francisco the first time, or was it just no? The it was just just a second. We had to be in that one exact spot mm. uh, in the ocean, right in that parameter where the international date line yep. and the equator meet. Yep, that one crossing. That's where the initiation is supposed to take place. And they, of course, we were concerned that maybe the Japanese were sitting there waiting for us too. You know, hey, here's another ship going to go through this initiation, but it didn't happen. So where? Uh, you're out there, you're headed, where were you going on that second voyage? Uh, to the Philippine Islands. And this would have been, do you recall the month? Uh, I think it was July, something in July. It was very warm weather. And uh, at this point, what were you transporting? Troops? We had troops, yeah. Inbound to the, the Far East? We were taking troops to the Philippine Islands into. Uh, into the island of invasion of Leyte uh, through the Philippine Sea, which is uh, more or less a, like a, a canal kind of thing, a channel rather. And we had to minesweep it to get through it, to be sure we got through it. The mine came to service, to the surface, and it was exploded by gunfire. And we had several of them. So it had to be sort of tedious to be going through there. Yeah, we have, we, they have an underwater uh, skimming thing that would, they had like torpedoes chained to the ship that would, would set at a certain angle so that they would force themselves out, force themselves down. And they would catch the chains of the mines, break them loose, and the mines would come to the surface. But they're this way, they're out from the side of the ship. So you side, so you weren't really afraid of running directly into them. Although you could have, but we didn't. Uh, they, we, they were brought to the surface by uh, mine sweeping, they called it, which was the, the veins, the chains. Uh, we knew what they were doing, and you could see them the way they'd set them up on the ship and let them over the side. And uh, of course, the troops were concerned, like ourselves, about exploding or whatever, you know. But they, everybody got the chance, if you wanted, you had the chance to take a Browning automatic rifle with a rail mount, which was a peg to stick a hole on the rail of the ship, and you could wait till one comes to the surface and you could shoot at it. Did you do that? I did it for maybe 10 minutes. It was it was an experience. That's all. It, and uh, I don't think I I didn't hit a mine. I might have hit it, but I didn't explode it anyway. But they rotated us some through the through the experience so that more guys could share it. Did you guys witness any combat? Are we involved in any combat? No, no. We the closer we came was uh, rifle fire from some of the islands in the as we passed them in the canal. In a channel, small arms fire. Small arms fire, yeah. This would have been Japanese soldiers, yeah, sailors that recognized yeah, the ship. Yeah, yeah. We're still on some of the islands that uh, hadn't been cleaned out yet. You know, some of them were tree snipers. You know, to hide up in a tree, and they could see a longer distance and you can shoot out at the ships. But we were far enough out that rarely ever got a, a rifle fire out there. No real problems with aircraft or submarines or no. We we took all the evasive actions we could. Uh, we went through the battle training stations, battle stations training, you know, and uh, they sound, periodically they sound the alarm. And you'd run to your battle station, but a lot of cases it was just training preparation, you know, having keeping your warrior. So, after participating in the invasion of Lady, where yeah. did you go after that? Uh, there was a group of islands called the Windy Isles, it's W-O-E-N-D-I-I, M-I-O, Mayo Windy. Uh, we spent a day there, picked up wounded soldiers, picked up some army nurses there. 
And that group we brought back home. We came back home with them, back to San Francisco. That was your home port at the time yeah. then, operating yeah. out of the Pacific? Yeah. How long did you stay in port? And, uh, probably about five days, I think it was, before we shipped out again. Uh, again, we went by way of the Panama Canal to the East Coast. Where did you go? I went to, uh, picked up troops in New York, dropped off what, some, some of the wounded that we had were sent to uh, hospitals in New York. So we dropped them off. We picked up troops to go to Europe, uh, Naples, Italy. We took troops to Naples, Italy. By then it was uh, combat had all moved north on the, in Italy. Okay, so you're 18 at this point. Yeah. What's this this we're far just, in? You've already been around the world. You know, heading around your second time. Yeah, What's yeah. going through your mind at this point? Uh, just uh, really amazement at uh, what people went through, you know, uh, uh, the customs that you'd see. In India, we saw the sacred cow. Walking in the street, you didn't push them out of your way. If they were in your way, you waited. Or the neighbors would come along and move them. Or if you were on a, riding a coolie cart, the coolie guy could move them, but you, could t you can't touch them. Uh, Eye opener for you, I imagine. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah, it was it was just amazing to see it. The food they ate, uh, they rolled some kind of leaf. They had some kind of beetle meat, uh, nut meat that they made up, uh, sauce, and they rolled it up, and they they would squat along the curb for blocks, and that'd be they're eating their meals there, you know, living there, cooking there, right on the streets. But we went through a berry berry time in India where they had a lot of beriberi and a lot, they had a lot of people dying on the streets. And they picked them up and took them. They had various religious ways of disposal, you know. Uh, the bodies were, some were put in the Huli River and allowed to float out to sea. They had little straw wharfs, they, uh, things they put them on, let them float out to sea. Some of them set on fire. Uh, they had burning pits where they put the bodies in the burning pits and pre-made them. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this was trying to control the disease mm -hmm. too. So. so did you head back to India after you were in Naples again? Is that where you were headed? Well, or? yeah, we went back through there, but we went to uh, uh, Calcutta, India, and uh, picked up uh, troops, dropped troops off. Well, mostly we picked up troops there. We had dropped them off in Naples and went up from there through the Suez uh, to uh, Calcutta, India, picked up troops to bring home. More from the uh, Burma China campaign, too. Did you head back across the Pacific to get home, or did you go back? No, we went, we went back across the Pacific. We went through, uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of another group of islands out there through the Philippine Sea, out into the northern, well, not the, the northern half of the South Pacific. It was another group of islands. I can't think of the name of them we went through. Uh, that was our, our second trip. But we went, we didn't stop. We went on through, we had one, we had one occasion where we took on fuel at sea. We had met a tanker. And that was on that trip back. We had to fuel up at, uh, in the Philippine Sea. Tell us a little bit about the, the commander of uh, the Hodges. Uh, our commanding officer was Conrad Hilton. He was the hotel magnate, uh, magnate I guess you call him, multi-millionaire with hotels all over the world. Uh, he wasn't a constant commander. I mean, he wasn't always present on the ship. Mm -hmm. He was a, a dollar a year man. He had, I think he had three or four dollars in a, in a frame on the bridge. And uh, I had gone up and s seen him once. Uh, he wasn't social, 
with the troops, with the uh, sailors. He was with the officers, of course, but uh, we carried a special little uh, craft uh, yacht of his own, uh, like a pilot boat, <laughs> that we maintained and took care of. And we, when we would pull into a port, he would go ashore in that boat and maybe check in his motels or whatever. I don't know what he was doing, but he was not always with us. He, we, he would pick us up, meet us when we were going to sea, and then he'd fly over and meet us on the other side. A couple of times he did that. And uh, he flew into the Azores once and we picked him up there. Because we didn't know that. I mean, the troop doesn't, the ship's crew doesn't know that. So mm -hmm. after the fact. That this is happening? Yeah. You think he's in there the whole time? Yeah. He, well, you're down on you're down in the engine room. How are you gonna? You don't know what's going on up on deck. The assignment that I had was refrigeration engineer. Uh, they had ships. They had refrigerators rooms on the upper decks of the ship where they kept frozen foods or cold foods, and that was generally the ship's officers' mess was fed out of that area. I had to go in up there with a, a chart board and read gauges, set temperatures, mm -hmm. maintain that, try to maintain that. And uh, there was always an opportunity for a little bit of ice cream or steak once in a while. To carry when you were yeah. up there? <laughs> yeah. What was the normal chow like on the, on the ship? Yeah, it, was, it was all right. Uh, of course, you always had stuff that you, you didn't particularly care for, but you always got hungry, you know, you eat. And you had to take what they served, and uh, or if you didn't take it, you lived on your own, whatever you could come up with, candy or whatever. Uh, the uh, ship had a store, for a GI store, where you could buy cigarettes and candies and drinks, and, uh, pop, different beverages, uh, no alcohol. The alcohol was provided when you went ashore on leave, mm -hmm. uh, on liberty rather. Uh, you, they had cases of 3-2 beer, I think they called it, 3-2, that they would put ashore on the island where you were going to be. Mm -hmm. And we did, we did get chances to spend time on some of the islands, just a, a, a break from... Get on dry land for a few minutes? Yeah, yeah. Get a chance to swim, sunbathe, have a cold beer, and they're not very cold, usually. What was that like for a Midwestern guy getting a chance to hang out? Oh, that was different. It was a different, it was a different uh, environment. The, the trees, the sand, uh, the temperatures, the views. Uh, in some cases, the natives, or we had natives on some of the islands we went to. Uh, it was a big ship. It had a big, drew a big draft. It was, you couldn't get too close to the islands unless you had a channel, a docking channel. And uh, so you, often we would have to go with landing crafts to go to the island to get a break for a while. So after, I think, uh, I guess you had some people you were in Calcutta. Where did, where did you go after that? That uh, you said took it back to San Francisco? Yeah, we took it back to San Francisco. Uh, we did one more trip to the uh, Pacific, into the Pacific Theater, to, uh, again, it was to Sydney, Australia, and into uh, Manila, the island of the city of Manila. We docked there. We docked at a place called Humboldt Bay, Hollandia, New Guinea. And that was to unload equipment and troops that we had picked up in uh, other other islands. And they were what it was a port, a point where they gathered the troops together to either into combat, further combat, or return to home. You know. Uh, 
like a repo depo or something yeah, like that? Yeah, something like that, Re, uh, rehab or something. And you got to be getting pretty close to the end of the war at this point, right? We're in late yeah, we were, we were at sea when the announcement that Japan surrendered. And, uh, of course, it was a jubilant occasion, you know, and uh, there wasn't a lot of military uh, conformity at that point. You, <laughs> everybody was celebrating. We're glad it was over. But uh, we, we had another, oh, I don't know, it was August. We had another few months to, before we decommissioned the ship. Took it into... Uh, Portsmouth in uh, California. We went in Seattle, Washington. That was our last stop. Uh, there we turned the ship over to Maritime uh, Marine, and they took the ship to put it in the mothballs. Moth I think it was I think it was Richmond, Indiana, Richmond, uh, California. Rather. Was that nearing the end of your service? Yeah, at that, that was, point. Yeah. Did you see the commander at that point at all, or did, was he taking care of you guys at all throughout? The well, he, yeah, he find some drinks. Occasionally, when we would <laughs> dock at some of the uh, places like in Naples, Italy, uh, he set up a bar at the end of the island. He made arrangements for each guy to have one drink. When you walked off the ship, you were given a, a chit. They called it. And you'd turn that in for your drink. Or if you didn't want it, somebody else would get it. You know, you'd give it to one of your buddies and you'd have a second drink. But uh, he did that about three or four different times, different ports. Uh, we didn't see him there. I mean, you know, he might have been there, but we didn't see him. Uh, the officers and the s sailors kept pretty separate, you know, except for the petty officers hung around with the sailors a lot. Um, so after the wars ended, you're turning, getting ready to turn the ship over to the Merchant Marine to be decommissioned. Yep. What, what's happening with the crew at that point? Uh, they were being discharged. Yeah, they were being discharged. Different ones were assigned to naval districts. Uh, I enlisted in Detroit, the Ninth Naval District, and that's where they sent me back. Was to the Ninth Naval District for. Uh, Discharge. I was discharged on Belle Isle. That was the, the right next to Belle Isle. Across the uh, water was a uh, naval coast guard station there, right by the bridge. Mm -hmm. They went over to Belle Isle. That's where I was decommissioned. Okay, still I was just discharged, rather. Huh? It's still there, isn't is it? it? I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's I'm a coast guard base down there, I believe. <laughs> uh, I was discharged on my dad's birthday. No, uh, May 22nd, 1946. Had you been back to Michigan since you left originally? At I point? was back twice for it was Christmas. First Christmas. Right. <clears throat> we came home in 1945, Christmas, uh, from the Atlantic area, and the ship was ice covered, and he was. Uh, a new experience to walk on that ship in rough waters. We were seven stories out of the water, but the water of the ocean would break over the bow of the ship. It would go down, and you were riding up and down. Uh, it was a new experience to be out there when you had to fasten yourself to the safety rail on the ship to walk from one end to the other, or from one door to the other, one hatch to the other. You had safety change you wore. Otherwise, you didn't belong on deck. I mean, you weren't there very long. You didn't. <laughs> what were some of the other memorable experiences you had uh, while you were on the ship? Oh, uh, the initiation into the uh, Neptune Society, the Golden Dragon, the uh, uh, experiences with the training sessions that we went through, the schooling. I took some schooling classes. Of course, your classes were a little bit different. They were, generally they were, you had a four hour class because you took a class when you were off watch. 
and there were pay periods when you were off watch that you had to sleep, and you had to eat, and you had to dress, you had to do all these things. So you took like an occasion that you did without some of your rest to get some of the classes you took. Yeah, I think we had four different instructors on the ship. I had uh, one military surgery with a toe that I had an infected in. And that wasn't bad enough to get me out of the duty. I still had to pull my duty, even with a shoe with the toe cut out. So seasick and all, and all that time. I got seasick the first day I went on. First day at sea, uh, they put me down in the engine room like with a bunch of other guys. And they have steel decks with little knobs on the decks for for safeties. And you, we had to scrub those decks with motor oil, diesel oil. Well, the diesel oil fumes alone would be bad, but the up and down motion of the ship. Is it? Side to side. Uh, <coughs> quick. <coughs> all this traveling, you must have had some tales to tell when you came home on leave and at the end when everything oh, yeah. went. I can only imagine. A lot of good guys I was in service with. Uh, uh, a lot of them that uh, I'd like to have seen afterwards and I never got an opportunity. They still hold uh, gatherings, but the crowd shrinks year to year. Uh, I get a listing once in a while. I'm, I had friends that, on a ship that I, from Columbus, Ohio, that I got down to see twice. Uh, I got into uh, Indianapolis to see, I have relatives in Indianapolis. I run into a couple of guys there that from Indianapolis that were in the service with me. And uh, one Amazing thing was I had a, uh, my uncle married this woman and had a son that was, he had lost his father. His father's gone somewhere, left the family. And he's looking for this father all over the country. Anyway, I run into him in New York City in Stage Door Canteen. Uh, he had joined the Merchant Marine. And then I ran into him again over in Naples, Italy. And in Naples, Italy, I saw the guy that lived across the street from me, guy Joe Olaniak. He was in the Navy, okay. and he was there at the same time I was. And uh, I stayed. I stopped at the Pepsi Cola canteen. I had my picture drawn there one night. And while I'm sitting there, this cousin guy walked up and got into the conversation, into the act, you know. Uh, we spent time together afterwards, but uh, he was all over, he was all over the world looking for his dad. Mm. He started out when he was about ten years old and left home, and parents never knew where, his mother never knew where, where he was. He was gone all the time. What did you do after he, you were discharged and got back to Michigan? What did you do after the war? Well, every GI, I guess, was entitled to fifty-two months of unemployment. And I went for the master. And I had 49 weeks of unemployment. $20, what was it, $20 a week or something like that? So you took a sabbatical? Yeah. Uh, during that period, uh, I did a few odd jobs, but mostly um, I took some school at uh, the Vry Technical Institute in Chicago, uh, some correspondence courses in radio and television, repair and maintenance. Uh, I took some schooling from Washington School of Arts in Washington, D.C., correspondence courses. Uh, the old Draw Me contest mm -hmm. group. Uh, so it, it wasn't that I didn't have anything to do. Uh, I had, I was trying to develop myself for a, a different kind of a job somewhere. And I got hired in as, uh, it's Chrysler Corporation mm -hmm. in uh, 1946, September 1946. And where was that at? Uh, Dearborn Lanyo Warehouse. You live on um, that side of town at that point? No, I lived here, still lived in the east side, but I had to ride over there. Uh, mostly bus ride. Early start in the morning, 
late night arrival at home at night with a long ride. When did you get married? In March 19th, 1948. And had you known Dorothy before? I met her through a cousin of mine at, uh, at the high school, at Persian High School, uh, when I came home from service. I had picked up my, this cousin of mine to take her home, and Dorothy was with her. And uh, we were together ever after. Still there. <laughs> you guys have kids and grandkids? Yeah, I have three children, two daughters and a son. I have uh, four grandsons and two great granddaughters. It's a beautiful family. And did you retire from Chrysler? Yeah, 41 years with Chrysler's. Retired in 1987, April of 87. And when did you move to Warren? 1960. Moved in, yeah, 1960. Uh, we had a house in Roseville, and uh, I-94 came along and got rid of us. Mm -hmm. Took our house. And that's what brought you here? Yeah, yeah. Chrysler's also had their offices here in Centerline mm -hmm. for the parts division. The Mopar? Yeah, Mopar. And that's where I was working. So it was convenient to make the move. Looking back over all the, all the miles you traveled at sea and all the experiences you had and the places you went, is there anything? Or several things that stuck with you throughout the course of your life. Anything that you learned, or anything that you that carried with you? Well, I think mostly just the the uh, patriotic feeling. I think that a lot of guys went through was was part of it was homesickness, you know. And uh, like every guy, I guess I had a period of it, but uh, I worked my way through that. I I, I collected mementos. Uh, on the island of Ceylon, which no longer exists as Ceylon, it's now Sri Lanka. The name was changed after that. While I was Ceylon, I picked up uh, some black ebony carved elephants. Uh, I had a, a bridge and six elephants on it, from small to a large. I also picked up a black ebony lamp that I gave to my father. I got back now. Uh, I have uh, a knife that I picked up in, a little folding knife that I picked up in a bar in New York City that served warm ale and Limburger cheese and crackers on the table. And that's not something you want to drink very much of. <laughs> but uh, different memorabilia that I picked up, a lot of coins, paper money from the, you know, uh, uh, occupation money, mm -hmm. paid, printed by the Japanese for the Philippine Islands kind of thing. I have a collection of that. I have a collection of coins. Uh, I got into this, into a stamp hobby. I picked up a lot of foreign stamps in foreign countries. Germany, I picked up a lot of German stamps in Italy. Mm -hmm. I was down in Italy, and I've got that collection. Um, I've, history has always been one of my major interests. And I got into this history museum thing by, as a volunteer, uh, with the City Historical Commission. And you're the docent now of the medium? Yeah. And uh, I've been doing volunteer work in Warren for 17 years. Uh, I started with managing Sandlot baseball team for summer, they baseball, for school vacation. After that, seven years of that, I switched over to <laughs> museum to the History Society. But I did genealogy work, so did my wife and I. Mm -hmm. We traveled a lot after the war, did uh, a lot of genealogical research for family records. Uh, I've got records of my family back to the Revolutionary War days. Okay. My wife's family back to the Doomsday Book. That's in William the Conqueror's period. Mm -hmm. uh, humble, humble family. But uh, it was 
you did a lot of traveling, you, lot, you did a lot of reading, you visited a lot of buildings or libraries, churches, uh, city halls, uh, funeral uh, parlors, all checking records. And uh, it kept me, kept us busy, gave us reason to travel. It was occupied our time up until we came here. I'm too old to do those things anymore. <laughs> we got a great memory. You really r recall. Oh, yeah. Time and stuff. It was my period as a soldier wasn't, as a sailor, wasn't the, the uh, dangerous thing that a lot of GIs faced. It wasn't the combat hand to hand warfare kind of thing. But it wasn't a matter of choice. Uh, I was willing to do what they gave me, and that's what I ended up doing. Certainly adventurous. I don't yep. think anybody would say yep. it wasn't. <laughs> there was a lot to see, a lot to do, a lot to remember. Uh, I guess I've never really forgot much of any of it. I stayed with it, you know. Anything else that we didn't discuss that you'd like to add? Oh, no, I think that uh, as a resident of Warren, I'd like to tell people that they have a good museum, they ought to come and see it. <laughs> Other than that, why? Have I had a good life? Excellent. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Leach. I appreciate well, thank it. You. Thanks again for your service. Okay. Thanks for sitting down it's with us. It's been my pleasure. Putting this on the record. Yeah. I hope our job was all right. <laughs>